Uh, I'm here today with Dr. Tom Holt, so I'll let you uh, explain who you are and what you do. Sure. I'm a professor in the School of Criminal Justice at Michigan State University, and I'm also the director of the program. In terms of my, my research, I study cybercrime, and I started looking specifically at computer hackers, and that was back in 2003. So a long time ago. Um, and I remember at the time when I was a PhD student thinking, well, this is either a really good idea or this is gonna go nowhere. And thankfully it worked out because we're now even more dependent on technology than we ever were. But um, at the time I was, I was really fascinated by the concept of, of hacking. Like I liked computers and video games and stuff like that, but I had no comprehension of computers to the extent that hackers do. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated at the amount of time and the, the like investment that individuals put into trying to fundamentally understand these things at profound levels. And that to me was, was really interesting because when we think about criminality generally, we don't always think of like specialization to the same degree that you see with hacking and with the the skills necessary to to be really effective mm -hmm. and so it's it's different from some forms of crime that we kind of think of on the everyday basis like robberies and violent crime and things like that this is kind of a, a very different animal yeah so there's a certain level of skill right that you need to understand from a fundamental perspective on your end so did you get a lot of training in like computer information systems or no. Um, in fact, my undergrad was in criminology and criminal justice, and so was my PhD. And I, I was into video games and computers, and I understood some things. And I had some, some friends from college who were system administrators and really knew the ins and outs of it. So as I got more intrigued, I started doing interviews with people, and um, part of my dissertation research was going to a hacker conference. And oh. Yeah, many people when they hear that don't really know what to make of that as an idea. And so I went to this conference in Las Vegas called DEF CON, and it's one of the world's largest hacker conferences. Mm -hmm. And when I went, it was like, it's going to sound silly, but it's a little bit like some parts of the movie where there's just loud music everywhere and there's crazy things to see and you don't necessarily understand everything that's happening around you, but the focus is almost exclusively on technology and games and things like that. So I learned a lot by talking to hackers and really asking them at times to explain things to me. So I fundamentally understood concepts. And then I started working with um, computer scientists and engineers. And then I started to get enough of an appreciation to understand the, the technical to a, to a basic degree. So while I'm not a computer scientist, I've kind of had to bootstrap my way up like a, like a hacker to understand the basics. That's really, really interesting. Because um, even like watching certain part of hackers, certain parts of hackers, it's like I still don't know what they're talking about. Like this is really outdated technology, but I still have no idea what these terms mean. <laughs> that's what's really funny about the movie. When you watch it, you think, oh, this is all like gobbledygook and, and made up words. And there's actually parts of it that are really technically accurate. And mm -hmm. the movie Hackers is a good example of attempts to kind of represent a, a culture or a subculture, but some parts of it are just really dull. Like the, the actual act of hacking is boring to watch. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating in practice if you know what's going on, but it is literally just a person pounding away at a keyboard for <laughs> hours and hours and hours. And toward the end of the movie, there's a scene where it's that, like it's a sped up like day and a half or two days of time just with people pounding on computers and reading. And that is what it is. So a lot of the, the visuals throughout the movie and the stuff that they do to try to make it look really kind of sexy or at least for the 90s look really advanced is horribly dated now. But the, the practicals of what they show are very real. Like uh, there's a scene later on in the movie where they're dumping into, or where they're jumping into garbage bins and they're digging for information or they're taking stuff from trucks. That's all very accurate because if you want information about a company or a target or whatever it is you're going after, the more you can dig up, the better. Right. So just as a really dumb question, and I apologize for this, um, but hacking just in and of itself is not an illegal act 
like when we just say hacking very broadly, that's not illegal? <laughs> right. So hacking is something that can be done for legitimate or exploratory purposes. Mm -hmm. And if someone is, as an example, trying to break their Wi-Fi or they're trying to jailbreak a phone, in practice, jailbreaking might void the warranty of the device or you might come into some sort of brush up against sort of what your cell phone carrier's policies are. But effectively, if it is your device, you can do whatever you want with it. The harder part though, is when you start crossing boundaries of ownership, when you start going into places where you clearly are not authorized to access, that's when you're getting into the illicit territory. Okay. So it becomes like privacy and ownership and all those good things. Yeah, it's a very good analogy to burglary. So you know someone's home is a place you're not allowed to enter without permission. Mm -hmm. Kind of the same thing with computer systems and networks. Either you're allowed to or you're not, or you get permission from the owner to do so. And so the, the kind of crux of the film where the cybersecurity professional, the plague, at um, the kind of focus of the movie, a lot of hackers have a... Well, excuse me, I guess I should say in the 90s, in the early 2000s, a lot of people who became cybersecurity professionals were hackers who'd been in the scene for a long time, may have done illegal things, and there's still kind of some precedent for hackers who've engaged in criminal acts to get into the security scene. So it's not unreasonable that that happens. Mm -hmm. It's essentially cat and mouse. What a hacker does is what a security professional needs to know how to do, so right. that way they can keep the hackers from getting in. Mm -hmm. uh, that reminds me of like on Criminal Minds, right? That all of all of the criminology students love <laughs> um, that Penelope Garcia was a hacker and was caught by the FBI. So then she was so good that they brought her in. That is a rare case though, right? <laughs> that um, yes and no. There are a lot of cybersecurity professionals who had um, questionable careers. They may not have been outright serious criminals, but if you are a person who wants to be effectively really good, the same expertise that you cultivate as a person, even on the fringes of the, the criminal aspect of the subculture, are gonna be the, the things that you need to know how to do in practice. So that degree of kind of lived and, and practical knowledge is, is accurate. It's just not every person today in the field, given how big it is, has a criminal background. And to be clear, we're not encouraging people to go out and break the law and do all kinds of illegal hacks so that they can be employed by the FBI. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but what, what is really fascinating is that when you go to hacker conferences and things like that, there's a very substantial presence of government agencies, of law enforcement agencies, because they use it as a recruiting event. So if you're at a place where that's all people do is live, sleep, and eat, cybersecurity and, and kind of hacking, well, where else would we go for this knowledge? If we want the, the best of the best, let's go find them. Wow, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. it's- Could it's be networking really, jobs. Exactly, and it's grown. Like I remember going in 2004 and you would see people there, you would kind of question, oh, are these guys law enforcement or not? And there were games made out of it. And so people get pulled on the stage and ask questions about where they work and all of that. It was a game called Spot the Fed. And yeah, it's this weird, in the movie, there's this kind of antagonistic relationship between the hackers and law enforcement. And there's a degree of truth to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting, right? Like the secret service approach to it. Um, in modern times, it's not, it, would it be the Secret Service that would be investigating this? It's a little bit of both. So the FBI handles a lot more of the national security type cases or the financials to some degree. If it's a targeted attack against a financial institution, the Secret Service still investigates those cases because of their prior role with the Treasury. Okay. And in the 80s, when the first cybercrime laws were created, particularly at the federal level, the Secret Service had the primary tasking because 
the primary focus was on financial institutions, but over time that's evolved. And so the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, as it was initially created, is now extended pretty far and it has more of a role for the FBI or DHS. And that includes um, both Homeland Security investigations and the Secret Service now to handle these types of crimes. Wow, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's kind of just broadened its scope all the way to all these different federal agencies. Mm -hmm. Because I guess we can't really escape this anymore. No. Right. Oh, interesting. Um, so do you want to start out maybe watching a video um, or kind of a clip from the movie and you can kind of walk us through some of these things? I feel like for me and maybe others who might watch, we need like baby steps explanations. Sure, sure. Mr. Simpson. Okay, so um, you can see they're in a computer lab and one's looking at what the other one's doing and he's clearly into another student's records so he's hacked the universe or the school's network and he's playing where he's not supposed to be and he starts changing his class schedule and that's something that does happen you can see the guy behind him is watching him mm -hmm. so clearly they know what's up and that's one of the really interesting things is how do hackers know one another? We traditionally, a lot of people in the general public might think hackers are loners. They don't have any need to connect with anybody in the real world. Mm -hmm. And that's patently false. Most hackers have good social skills. They're not all completely incapable of, of getting along with other people. It's just, it's hard. And this movie's set in New York City where you've got a much higher likelihood of people having a degree of technical expertise and know-how. But growing up in a city like East Lansing is not especially huge. Um, right. In the 90s or in the early 2000s, the degree of technological access could have been very different. Mm -hmm. And so the, the connections that people could make were, were somewhat smaller. So hacker social networks are, are dependent on what's around them. So sometimes it may just be all online, sometimes it'll be in person. And I think the movie did a really good job of showing that it is very social, not just within this group of, of wayward kids, <laughs> um, but that it was like this international and kind of like national community. Mm -hmm. And that carries over now today still. Absolutely. It's, it's hokey, this idea of hack the planet that kind of comes up a lot at the end. But you hear it a lot now, kind of tongue in cheek at hacker conferences and, and events. But there really is a global community online. And um, one of the other things that's really very accurate when you watch the film is how much um, the characters sort of challenge one another. And it's like, well, show me what you know or tell me what you know. Mm -hmm. And at one point, a character says, you guys always act like you know everything, but you never tell me anything. Well, that's part of how the culture actually works. There's this emphasis on demonstrated knowledge. If you show us what you know, then we'll tell you what else you may need to know, or at least you need to demonstrate good faith efforts on your part to understand a question yourself. Because if you just use a bunch of tools or you don't fundamentally understand how the systems operate or how the software works, your hack isn't gonna succeed. So the more you can developmentally grow and incrementally demonstrate expertise, the more likely it is that you fundamentally understand things. And so they are more likely to call you uh, a competent hacker as opposed to just um, kind of in the parlance of the hacker community, a script kitty, somebody who doesn't know what they're doing. Um, that's really interesting. I mean, that sounds like a really good pedagogical tool, right, in terms of getting better and improving. Um, so that's really interesting. I, I do have another question. There's a lot of like kicking in doors here and very like violent <laughs> raids and like no knock, <laughs> no knock kind of situations. Is that an appropriate law enforcement response or a common law enforcement response? Um, uh, that's a good question. There's a reason that agents, particularly around cybercrime cases like this, may be less inclined to announce themselves. Mm -hmm. And so later on in the film, not at the beginning, but later on in some of the scenes, um, hackers are, are like actively ripping up papers or they're hiding places and or they're hiding things in different places. Mm -hmm. And there's a recognition among the competent that if you're doing overtly illegal or, you know, if you're engaging in activities that especially rise to the attention of federal law enforcement, you better delete every single thing you have or have a protocol in place that will wipe everything okay. to the extent that you can, because 
you're just sitting on a mountain of evidence that implicates you. Right. And so there, there is some accuracy in wanting to minimize the potential that somebody knows you're there because if they think that something is coming, they may try to just wipe everything and run. Mm -hmm. They may not succeed, but it's worth trying just to help kind of minimize the, the evidence against you. Right. And I, I always question, you know, when we watch any kind of crime show, if it's that dramatic, because as we know, it's, it's usually not. But when they were like kicking in doors and shoving guns in faces, I was like, oh, this seems like an overreaction. <laughs> but especially at the beginning, um, when we're talking about a, a young boy, and Gosh. even when Joey gets arrested, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you would suspect they know the age of their target and the need for whether a fully armed response is necessary, but right. um, sometimes you don't. And so there's, there's reason to have concerns, um, especially if you're, you're thinking the, the suspect is somebody in their mid-20s or their early 20s and is pretty savvy, mm -hmm. or if they're engaged in a lot of financial crimes, that they could have a lot of disposable income and who knows what else on hand. So mm -hmm. it's not unreasonable that there would be kind of a, a heavier guns out approach. Um, if we're talking about a juvenile, it's kind of a different story. And um, some of it might be more attractive for the film just to have it be more like, oh, let's let's get in there. Right, but, very dramatic. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. But some, some countries have taken a much more passive approach to like the the UK now has a program where they will have agents show up mostly at juveniles' homes and say, hey, we know what you're up to. We need to talk to your parents and we're going to talk to you. And they'll do more of a more of a calm kind of reserved approach. But the idea is that we we bet dollars to donuts. Your parents know that you have skill, but they don't know what you do with it. And so if we actually start explaining to them, oh, here's what your son or daughter to a much lesser extent are doing, and here's what that means, and here's what that means for them in terms of potential incarceration, suddenly mm -hmm. the whole thing flips and they're like, oh, we, we didn't know. We honestly had no idea. <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, that seems like a better approach, right? Like a more moderate approach to it. Yeah, and part of it too, we don't see a lot of arrests really at the federal level. You don't get the same number of arrests for hacking, especially that you do for all the other myriad forms of crime. Mm -hmm. So these are, are relatively infrequent compared to drug arrests or, or anything else that crops up federally. That's more commonly associated with violence, right? And guns and, and such. A lot of the federal prosecutions, are you're only going to get a, a hacker arrested if you can place them in the United States and really get that, that local tie down. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some, if you look historically, there's a lot of variation in terms of what federal courts are prosecuting hacking cases. So you tend to see them a lot in like New York State, California, Texas and North Carolina, kind of where there are huge financial hubs or, or places where there's more of a tech presence. And you see fewer of them in the Midwest and in some areas. So there, there's a lot of things that drive that kind of local response too. That makes sense. Um, I guess we can watch one more video, um, maybe about the trial, right? The opening scene with sure. the trial, because this is a pretty damning prosecution, right? Like this is a, this is a, this is a monologue here. Um, so if we want to watch that one, uh, you can kind of talk us through that. Sure. Okay. And so, yeah, we were just talking about the the kind of takedown of this kid, or at least we don't know he's a kid yet, but when they show it, it's like, holy cow, this is the, the master hacker who who took down, what is it, uh, over a thousand computers? Mm -hmm. And this they're talking about his handle he's zero cool that is something that's accurate hackers do go by various nicknames online in the hopes of concealing their real identity and they're talking about how this is a smart person how you know they they did this really damaging hack that compromised uh, this 1507 systems including wall street and suddenly you pan down to this kid now what's fascinating is that most kids at that age don't tend to engage in a hack of this magnitude. It has happened. There's a couple of examples, like there's a Canadian hacker that went by the name Mafia Boy, but this was, I think, 1999 or 2000, and he engaged in a denial of service attack against a, a couple of major retailers at the time. 
And so they, they happen, but we tend to see attacks of that magnitude more in the late teens, early 20s. It's less likely the, the 12, 13, 14 year olds. Mm -hmm. Is it just because of knowledge or skill or they just lack that, or even like of a larger infrastructure about organizations and companies? Yeah. So by and large, a hack of that magnitude would take a 12 or a 13 year old who would have to have an extremely high degree of technical competence. Mm -hmm. That's not to say it's impossible, but that would have to be a kid who really understands programming languages well, has written that kind of code before, or developed something and it didn't go exactly as they planned. And so the compromise went way out of control. There's a couple of historical examples like that. Um, there's something called the Morris worm from, I think it was 1990, or excuse me, 1988. So it was one of the first real attacks against the internet. And the person who made it, Robert Morris, claimed that he was trying to build a tool to assess the scope of the internet. And it was misconfigured and it was an error on his part. And so it caused this widespread attack. Now, whether or not that's accurate, the attack was of such magnitude that it required the formation of essentially the world's first computer emergency response team, the sort of extra legal approach to dealing with a, a serious cybersecurity threat. Wow. So it's, it's not out of the realm of possibility. It's just for a person of that age, it's, it's very unlikely. Okay. Well, this has been fascinating. I feel like I learned a lot, but I also realized that I know nothing about anything. <laughs> well, that's the, that's the fun part about cybercrime is that there, it really helps you understand there's so much about the technology that we depend on that we, we as the average user don't really appreciate mm -hmm. that we should be a lot better informed about the technologies we use. If you, if you really understood why patching your system was important, because if you do so, it helps reduce the likelihood a hacker can get in. Well, that makes perfect sense. I would run that patch, but not everyone gets that or it's hard to get people to understand in practice. And so movies like Hackers and things that kind of help to point out, even if it's in an overly dramatic and kind of dated fashion are, are pretty valuable. And, and some of the things that they show, the dumpster diving, the, the skill building, there's some real world practical stuff in there about how hacking actually works. Even the, um, there's a discussion midway through the film about the hacker manifesto. One of the secret service agents is in a car and he's reading it and he's like, a manifesto, come on. That was actually written and posted online and I think it was 1984. And it became, yeah, it became this sort of fundamental underground document that really, helped to, to drive young hackers to understand nobody gets why we're into this and they've criminalized our behavior, but there's nothing inherently wrong with what we're doing. We're just trying to understand the limits of the technology. They don't get that they're using these tools that are massively powerful and they don't, don't seem to understand or don't care. And so stuff like that is, is actually real and it's been around for a long time and it kind of has informed the, the perspective of hackers of that generation. That's really, really fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. And 1984, my God, who even thought? <laughs> I know. Yeah. I know, it's amazing. And so, yeah, movies like War Games, Hackers, there's, there's tons of different things you can point to. Mm -hmm. And they are stylized and they're dramatic, but they, they do have some basis in fact. That's good. This might be a win because the other things that we've talked about on this on this channel prove that everything in movies and television is false. So this might be <laughs> our first win. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm glad yeah. to hear that. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to talk to you about this. Same. Thank you.